Hi, my name is Simmons Bunton. I am the editor-in-chief of Terrain.org, and I am happy to welcome you this evening um, to this dual reading between Terrain.org and Writing the Wild. Um, we're so excited that you are with us. Um, again, howdy from Tucson, Arizona, uh, where I'm sitting at about 2,100 feet above sea level and I am located among five stunning mountain ranges, the highest of which is just a little over 9,200 feet. Um, I'm also surrounded by a strange and delightful mix of cactus and flowering trees and intoxicating shrubs and venomous critters, plus some coyotes and ringtails and bobcats and mountain lions and quatamundi and javelina and gila monsters and tarantulas and tarantula hawks and carpenter bees and road runners and hummingbirds and curved-billed thrashers and red-tailed hawks and other birds, small and large, which certainly Drew knows a lot more about than I do. And where am I? Much more here in the unceded lands of the Odom and more recently the Yaqui and uh, them all. Uh, welcome again to the Terrain.org and Writing the Wild online reading. Again, my name is Simmons Bunton. I am the editor-in-chief of Terrain.org, the world's first online literary journal of place. And if you see me looking around, that's because I'm also admitting folks as they come in. Um, we have a particular focus on place, climate, and justice. And I'm so glad that you are spending your Thursday evening with us. Some other thank yous to go along with my thanks for the wonder that is the Sonoran Desert, where I'm located. Um, our hosts, Chrissy Clute, and J. Drew Lanham from Writing the Wild, who I will introduce in more detail here in just a moment. And thank you to our readers, Rowan White and Michael Cleaver Diggs and Elizabeth Bradfield, who you will hear from in, um, I'm sure, what will be an amazing source of way. And of course, thank you to our readers, to you, our audience. We're so excited to have you here with us this evening. Okay, if your connection becomes slow, you may wanna turn off your video. In all cases, please remain muted, but you're welcome to post your questions, not just welcome, really encouraged to post your questions and other positive feedback in the chat area. And then Chrissy and Drew will turn to those questions during the Q&A that follows our reading this evening. We are recording this and all readings and we'll make those available from train.org and our YouTube channel um, not long after the reading, probably this weekend. Um, we'd love if you would officially follow our YouTube channel, and maybe there's one for um, Writing the Wild as well. Let me just put my the, the terrain.org YouTube channel is right there, if you'd like to follow us at some point. Don't leave the reading to do that, of course, but maybe after. Okay, um, now a few announcements and other words about terrain.org, which is celebrating 25 years of publishing this year. Um, and a note, uh, Chrissy will say a little more about Writing the Wild before she and um, inter uh, Drew introduce our readers as well. So a couple Train.org announcements. Uh, bear with me. Thank you. The winners of the Train.org 14th Annual Prize in Poetry, Nonfiction, and Fiction will be announced by this end of this month. So if you're one of those submitters, keep your fingers crossed. We haven't notified anybody yet. Okay, um, the finalists of the second annual Sal Emerging Writers Prize, which is a poetry manuscript this year, will be announced in January. We're definitely still making our way through those submissions. And our regular submission period for poetry closes on January 31st and for nonfiction and fiction on March 31st. So you still have plenty of time to get your submissions in for that. Let me just throw that link in here where you can learn about all of our submissions. Um, Chrissy, you're welcome to throw your links in there as well as you'd like. Um, from an events perspective, we have a couple really exciting in-person readings to finish up Terrain.org's 25-year anniversary happening first. On January 11th at 7 p.m. down here in Tucson at the University of Arizona Poetry Center, we are hosting a reading with Allison Adele Hedgecoke, Derek Sheffield, Billy Swarstad Johnson. If you're in the area, you don't want to miss this one not only because the Poetry Center is a really stunning venue, which it is, but because we've got um, these stunning readers as well. Plus, we'll have some cool free broadsides created by Juniper Moon, our broadside editor. I should also mention that it will be live streamed on the Poetry Center's YouTube channel. Again, that is on January 11th at 7 p.m. Okay, if you're going to AWP in Kansas City, 
Terrain.org is hosting our final 25th anniversary reading at the historic Kirk Family YMCA, uh, real close to the convention center, on Thursday, February 8th at 6 p.m. This will be a fun one. Our readers will be Taylor Brorby, Kirk Caswell, Elizabeth Dodd, Sean Enfield, C. Marie Furman, Suzanne Frischkorn, Renata Gold, Renata Golden, and John T. Price. So you don't want to miss that one. Okay. Um, we'll get details for both these readings up on the train.org website soon. But hey, let us not leave out the Riding the Wild upcoming events because there's a really cool one that's happening on Tuesday, December 12th from 4 to 5 30 p.m. Mountain Time. It's called Contending with Winter, a campfire story on mutualism with naturalist interpreter Eric Smith. And then Chrissy will conduct an interview with Eric following um, the campfire circle. Let me give you the registration link for that right there. So that's going to be pretty stunning, too. I can't wait to be a part of that. Okay, finally, did you know that Terrain.org is an all-volunteer organization and that we are advertisement-free and, except for contests, do not charge to submit, nor do we ever, nor will we ever, charge to access our the amazing contributions on our website? How do we do that, you may be asking? Well, through donations, of course. Terrain Publishing, uh, which is Terrain.org's parent organization, is a 501c3 tax-exempt organization and will gladly accept your dona donation at terrain.org slash online. I'm sorry, terrain.org slash donate um, to keep this endeavor of love and place and climate and justice going. So thank you for your consideration. And that is the last you'll hear of me other than this link right here, where you can donate online if you'd like about that. Because we're not here really to talk about terrain.org. We're here to listen to these amazing readers um, who we are going to introduce shortly. Okay, so um, as the readers are introduced and as they're reading, but not to interfere, I will be posting terrain.org and book links and other links in the chat in support of our readers. So keep an eye out for those. Also, be sure to post your thoughts and questions in the chat as we look forward to an engaging conversation following the readings. And finally, thank you again for joining us. It's my pleasure now to introduce our two hosts this evening, two of the finest people you could ever know offline and on. So let me start with um, Drew, because I know Drew's going to talk first. Writing the Wild co-director Drew Lanham, J. Drew Lanham, is the author of the Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, which received the Southern Environmental Law Center's Reed Award and the Southern Book Prize, and was a finalist for the John Burroughs Medal. His most recent book is Sparrow Envy, Field Guide to Birds and Lesser Beasts. He is a birder, naturalist, and hunter conservationist who has published essays and poetry widely. And um, let's see, a 2022 MacArthur Fellow, Alumni Distinguished Professor of Wildlife Ecology, and a master teacher at Clemson University. He and his family live in upstate South Carolina, a soaring hawk's downhill glide from the Southern Appalachian escarpment that the, the Cherokee once called the Blue Wall. And I'm gonna introduce Chrissy yet, but first I want to throw in the link to an interview we have between John Lane and Drew Lanham over at terrain.org. Drew, I don't know if you know this, by the way, I was a wildlife biology minor. Okay. Um, at Auburn University, so another Tiger School. All right, uh, but enough about me. Let's now turn to Chrissy Clute. Chrissy uh, is a poet and writing the wild executive director and guide who writes about mystery, the land, divine love, and the passage of time. Creator of Writing the Wild, she guides retreats and workshops on writing, creativity, and nature connections. She is a convener and a former public school teacher. She brings a holistic learning approach to the experience she guides. Her first volume of poetry is forthcoming. Um, if you have a link for that, post that in uh, the chat, Chrissy. That's exciting. Congratulations. Um, and she works and plays in the East Bay outside of San Francisco on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone and the Miwok peoples with her husband and two sons. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, J. Drew Lanham and Chrissy Clute to uh, introduce our other readers. Thanks all. Thank you so much, Simmons, and thank you to each and every one of you in the squares 
but out there um, in the Ethereum. It, it's, it's a pleasure to see you all wherever you are. Uh, a special thanks to Simmons for, for making this space along with Chrissy. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here in the upstate of South Carolina, again, very close to the Blue Wall, um, the Cherokee home, but also a place that has been altered by the hands of those forced to labor, labor um, through chattel enslavement. And so I want to recognize the ancestors um, in this moment, but also um, give appreciation for the nature that surrounds each and every one of us that sustains us, that gives us an opportunity to be us, whoever we are, wherever we are. I look forward to, I'm proudly associated with terrain.org. It's been a great friend um, to me and um, to my writing career, but, and also most recently, with Writing the Wild as a co-director, facilitator, and I think what I would like to call Chrissy a feel guide. And so with that, I'll send it to Chrissy so we can get on with our readers. Chrissy? Thank you so much, Drew. And thank you, Simmons. We're just so excited to be partnering with this phenomenal organization, Terrain.org, to make this happen tonight. And I have the pleasure, Drew and I have the pleasure of introducing our three readers who are all part of our Writing the Wild program this year, Writing the Wild, a year-long writing cohort. But we also have these other offerings like the reading tonight, um, putting together spaces to um, connect with the earth, to connect with our own inner wildness, and we're just delighted to create this space um, with you alongside you tonight. So without further ado, I want to introduce Rowan White. Rowan is a seed keeper and a farmer and an author from the Mohawk community of Aguasasne. And she's a passionate advocate, activist for indigenous seed and food sovereignty. She is the creative director of Sierra Seeds, an innovative indigenous seed bank and land-based educational organization located in North San Juan, California, not too far from me. Rowan is the founder of the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network, which is committed to restoring the indigenous seed commons and currently serves as a cooperative seed hub coordinator. She facilitates creative hands-on workshops and strategic conversations in community around seed and food security around the country within tribal and small farming communities. She believes that by cultivating creative, supportive learning spaces, reclaiming narratives and practicing radical imagination, we can work together to seed the change for a more equitable and beautiful relational kin-centric food system that centers around a deep sense of belonging and connection. She weaves stories of food, culture, and sacred earth stewardship on her blog, Seed Song, and in other distinguished publications. So I have heard Rowan read her work before. Um, I am so excited to bring her into this terrain space. The work she does is, is powerful and she writes about it um, as a, a radical futurist and a really thoughtful human being. So Rowan, we're excited to hear from you. Thank you, Sego, Sewa Guego, Ganyat Daho Yungyat, just introduce you and to you in my indigenous language of Mohawk. So I'm gonna read from two uh, publications tonight. The first is an essay that I wrote called Sky Woman's Garden, which was published in the Kinship, Belonging in a World of Relations um, collection that was edited by Gavin Van Horn, Robin Walkimmer, and John uh, Haustofer. So I'm just gonna read a short ex excerpt because it kind of is a good lead in to the next one. Years ago, I accepted sacred bundles of ancestral seeds of my Haudenosaunee ancestors and began a decades-long unconventional rites of passage ceremony in which the plants and the earth helped me to grow into a deeper understanding of what it means to be a Mohawk woman in my full capacity. I was told by my wise elders that there is a cartography of stories that reside in the landscape 
that help us Mohawk people remember who we are, where we came from, and how to live in a way that honors our responsibility to be a descendant of good mind and a bright future ancestor. As we traverse the seasons, we walk across a memory landscape of stories that help us remember our place in the mycelial network of kinship all around us. It was original woman who came here to this layer of existence, clutching a handful of seeds and proceeded to sing the world awake, sowing her seeds into the earth that was upon the back of a great turtle. She came tumbling down from the sky world into a watery abyss and all of our relations conspired to make a suitable home for her and all of us, her descendants. This beautiful layered creation story, which began so long ago, continues to unfurl and come alive in every moment as our original life sustainers emerge from the soil in our gardens and sing a song that helps us remember our original agreements to take care of one another. Dancing in the direction that the sun goes, first woman put into place the cycles of continuous creation, continuous birth inside of the earth and all around us. Sky woman gave birth to a beautiful daughter soon after arriving here in this new world. And in time, she too bore the two twins which would continue to help shape this place that we call home. During the birth of these original twins, Sky Woman's daughter passed away in labor, and in her dying breaths, she claimed that the foods needed to sustain her descendants until the end of time would sprout from her body in her earthen grave. True to her word, from her breasts sprouted the corn who would grow in diversity to feed both villages and empires. Twining bean vines emerged from her hands to offer long and slender pods filled with nourishing seeds. And rockish squash tendrils grew from her belly button to produce sweet and sustaining pumpkins and squashes to feed people well in the deep of winter. Sunflowers and original potatoes grew from her legs tobacco for our prayers from her head, and life-affirming first fruits of the strawberry emerged from her heart. Seeing that these original fruits grew from the body of our first ancestors, we understand that we are lineal descendants of these foods that nourish us. We understand that these seeds are our relatives and we are bound to them in a mutually beneficial relationship since the dawning of time. These agreements to care for them are held in the earth of our bodies as well as into the soil where we plant them. We plant these seeds into good earth season after season to renew our commitment to tending a relational kin-centric way of nourishing our communities and families, just as countless ancestors have done in our homelands of Turtle Island. We plant our seeds each season in a continuation of prayer and ceremony of remembrance of these threads of kinship and lineage that have been given to us forever with the promise that we would have good food to eat. As an indigenous woman returning to my traditional life ways, after many, many generations of disruption from the unspeakable culture erasure and violence of genocide, assimilation of colon col colonialism, I have to be a patient listener to the memory of the old ones, both human and more than human, who have left achingly beautiful stories and songs in our blood and in our bones and in the landscape all around us just waiting for the monsoons of time to rain down, to coax them into sprouting once again into our modern lives. So that's just a short excerpt from that piece. And it kind of sets the stage for the next piece, which is a, um, a chapter in a book that was edited by Melissa Nelson and also John Haustofer. 
called What Kind of Ancestor Do You Want to Be? Uh, published by University of Chicago Press. And we were posed to answer that specific question of which, what type of ancestor would you like to be? And I said that I would like to be an ancestor who nourished. And so this is a, an excerpt from that particular essay. In our Mohawk stories, our elders tell us our life here on earth is a gestation, a reproductive cycle that mirrors the life cycles happening all around us. At our birth, we are a sprouting of all of our ancestors' wildest dreams. And at death, we are a sowing of all that we pray and hope for for future generations. While we are alive and walking this pathway of life, we are continually reminded in our ceremonies and in our stories about the importance of the cultural seeds we can grow and incubate in our lives in the grand hope that much more life will sprout from our graves and our memory when we too become ancestors. It is our obligation as responsible living descendants to do our best to keep our traditions alive and pass them down to our children. Now me, as a mother who sings the sacred seed songs to her children in a humble act of keeping these ancestral traditions alive, I think of all those who came before me, who endured such incredible adversities so that I could stand here today with seed corn in hand and the love of thousands beating in my heart. I whisper to my daughter, water that seed planted deep inside the earth that is your own body a tiny seed that sings an achingly beautiful song of remembrance, resistance, resilience, redemption, reconciliation. It was this powerful seed song that kept our grandmothers upright, who whispered to them to get up amidst the sorrow, to do what must be done to tend the earth and feed the children. It was these melodies that guided our grandfathers under the sea of stars as they made their way to, into new lands to protect the young. This map is written in the seeds and in the stars and in the earth and in the waters. This song, daughter, is now your heart beating fiercely in promise to uphold the agreements to feed the sacred hungers of time. Now, as a fa farmer and a traditional seed keeper, I can only imagine and hope that my essence and legacy as an ancestor will be one that nourishes my descendants in the form of embodied prayers that will reside as seeds passed down through the generations from ones that took root here on our family farm. This prayer is one of regeneration that we will continue in the steps of our ancestors to carry songs and stories and prayers that will sustain our future, gen our future descendants. I can only pray that my memory and my ancestral legacy will be that of a seed song sung from the lips and mouths of my grandchildren who know no hunger. There is a tiny spirit fire burning in each one of these kernels of corn that we are planting under the growing moon a tiny spark of life that holds the breath and prayer of those who came before us. Those ancestors prayed that we, generations later, would have good food to eat and clean water to drink and the good health of mind and vibrant health for all our relations. These prayers now reside within our blood and bones because of the generosity of seeds who feed us each and every day. These prayers kindle our own spirit fire to be a continuation on behalf of our children. Keeping the seeds alive that were passed down through calloused and loving hands of my ancestors, perhaps even my great grandmother, Anna Jacobs, who loved her garden and to feed her family and community. May our hearts be in promise to make our lives love poems and honor songs that will nestle inside of these seeds that we tend and care for, so that a little of our life might go forward into the future in the tiny living capsules of seeds to feed those yet to come. 
May our daily focus in whatever small and sacred way be an honoring song for all the wealth of food and seed and story that our ancestors left for us. As I am focused in my daily work in the fields and in my community, I often think of the wise words of Sitting Bull who said, let us put our minds together and see what life we can make for our children. As stated in a Dakota proverb, we will be known forever by the tracks we leave behind. I can only pray that our ceremony of every day is that my ancestral tracks will be a life-giving tangle of vigorous green leafy vines and blossoms of all shades, a basket and bundle full of seeds with my prayers and seed songs vibrating at their core. I think tonight as I shell beans of my great-grandmother Anna, whose legendary gardens and steadfast work ethic are still remembered in our family line. I like to think that perhaps she would have grown these very beans and that we would have enjoyed shelling them together or trading garden secrets. What will endure of me when I leave this body of mine? And how, I, how will I become a good ancestor? That is a lifelong love poem that I compose a little more of today in my cornfield. I make a tiny hole for a little seed. In each dimple that my finger makes in the warm and moist earth beneath my knees, I place a pearlescent corn seed. I sing a little song, I cover it up and move to the next in the matrix of this cornfield that I am planting. I make another hole, another prayer, another seed, and so on until this whole field is planted. I have my family and children nearby, and sometimes we talk and we laugh, and other times we plant quietly, softly singing the seed songs that my children have known since before they were born. Maji ishka, maji ishka, mani dumines, ashkena, minu bema dizuin. Come in your own time, sacred seeds. Bless us with this good life. We humbly ask you that you might come grant us good life. As those seeds move into their dark night, courageously they allow themselves to be undone, seed coats cracking and splitting open as they transform themselves into imaginal beings of vibrant cobs of corn multiplying exponentially. These ancestral seeds who were once witnesses to the past are the keepers of a record of plant-human relationship, one that predates the written word. Within the heart of each one of these seeds are countless ceremonies and stories that come alive each season and are harvested and imbibed. If all goes well this season, these seeds will multiply and be planted again and again. These seeds will outlive me, but my seed songs will live eternally at the heart, in the heart of these seeds as they are passed down from generation to generation. May my life be such a grand sowing. May the seeds that I have cultivated and tended in my life, the speckled ones, the zebra striped ones, the teardrop shaped ones, multiply exponentially to be shared across kinship routes of the heart to many, perhaps people I will never meet, who will lovingly tend to such earth and hand prayers. May my seed songs live on inside the heart of each one of these seeds that I've planted and have had the honor to get to know in my meanderings in the dawn, sitting quietly under the waving corn stalks while honeybees gather ochre pollen grains and the hummingbird sips dewdrops. I want to be that ancestor, just like my great-great-grandmother, who didn't forget our responsibility to leave a good bundle of food and seed and story for our next generations, who despite all the adversities, the displacements, the busy schedules, the joys and pains, didn't forget about the seeds and how much they meant to us as a people that amidst the era of the industrialization of our food system, that we were the ones who didn't forget. We were the ones who remembered to keep the seeds alive for our children, 
real seeds with flavor and terroir of the land, with the stories and ancestral memories of our ancestors still intact. Thank you so much. So we'll put links to those books and those publications so you can read the other parts of that essay and just read excerpts. So thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Rowan, for those beautiful, beautiful readings. Thank you for sharing, for sharing that with us this evening. And now for our second, Michael Kleber Diggs. Michael is a poet. Michael is an essayist and a literary critic. His debut poetry collection, Worldly Things from Milkweed in 2021, won the Max Repo Poetry Prize. Among other places, Michael's writing has appeared or is forthcoming in Poem A Day, Poetry Daily, Poetry Northwest, Potomac Review, Hunger Mountain, Memorius, and various anthologies. Congratulations. Since 2016, Michael has been an instructor with the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. He also teaches creative writing in Augsburg University's Low Residency MFA program and at St. Paul Conservatory for Performing Artists. He lives in Minneapolis. And I will tell you that I know this brother as a natural resource. I know him as someone who pours into souls. I know him as someone who is big sky and solid earth. And I am looking forward to hearing what he has for us this evening. Michael? Mm, Drew, thank you so much. So grateful for you. I think all the time about our first meeting, which was not long after the home place came out and uh, we shared conversation about the book and through the book to like things that we shared in common and uh, that time together meant a lot to me and I returned to it all the time. It's really a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Rowan, I, I have to say this is, uh, this is the season of darkness. And this is a time of darkness among many dark times in the history of our life here on the planet. And so many ideas that you shared in that beautiful and wise reading um, spoke to me on a profound level as I walk around sometimes thinking, what can we do? What should we do? Um, I'm going to return to your idea. I'm going to return to our original agreements to take care of one another. That's that's what we're here. That's what we're meant to do. I have a handful of poems to share. Uh, I'll start with Postcard to Sean, which is a poem that I wrote to Sean Hill, um, a poet I admire a great deal. I know he's a terrain stalwart. Uh, you know I was thinking about Sean today because he's a birder also, Drew, um, and I had a workshop with him and he had us write postcard poems and talked to us about the importance of research to poetic practice. And, uh, I wanted to write postcard poems for my book too. And this is postcard to Sean for SH, postcard to Sean or fraternity or chance. For example, I might write, I thought of you the other day on the trail through woods due south of the Minnesota river just west of the Capitol. So quiet there, I heard critters scurry along the path and leaves and twigs rustle and snap, my own feet falling while I puzzled my way through some particular poem part, wanting to know more about prayer, a specific Catholic prayer I used to recite. Sean, a bird, tweeted or trilled a morning song quite short, quite grand, it got me wondering what creature calls with notes above the rattle, which led me back to you, who might know, or research until you did, 
you out west in Fairbanks, north of me yet still sleeping, or up with your baby boy as once I was up with my baby girl. Or I might write to fatherhood instead, or happenstance, because postcards to people are postcards to ideas, to ideals, to abstractions, they're psalms. Quite short. Anyway, I wanted to reach out to you and these other things to say, brother, I looked it up. I'm pretty sure it was an indigo bunting. Pretty sure it was. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did the thing. I'm starting to get a group of poems together thinking, you know, maybe this is the direction toward a second book. Uh, and let's put a start by putting them in one place and see how they're talking to each other and I know sometime in 2026, 2027, maybe I'll have something to share. I am speaking to you tonight from just outside a large regional park in the Twin Cities uh, where I live. This is the unceded land of the Dakota and Ojibwe people, people who are still here today, stewarded in this land, uh, teaching us new ways, ancient ways, new approaches, and um. One of the things I do all the time is I walk uh, with my dogs in the park. Uh, and I wanted to share tonight a villanelle uh, about our, our adventures called Canine Superpowers, Como Park Woodland Outdoor Classroom for Ziggy and Jasper. We stroll the grounds and stop at every tree at every chicken bone, each new cone flower. Their noses lead to everything we see. I'd be asleep if it were up to me. Still slick with dew, this city park seems ours as we stroll the grounds and stop at every tree. Perils persist, real possibilities. I scan the grass for things they can't devour. Their noses notice things that might harm me. Sometimes we'll spot a fox, surprise a bee, find a trash, broken glass, have a sad encounter on our daily rounds to check on every tree. Three times we've come upon wild coyotes. Since before seen through canine superpowers, all of them have smelled what I'm soon to see. They stare, we stare, there's no anxiety. Milliseconds transform into hours. We stroll the grounds and stop at every tree. Their noses lead to everything I see. Our daughter uh, graduated from college in May and did not return home to Minnesota. Uh, as was planned, it's taken up residence in New York City. So I've been really just thinking a lot about the time when we were parenting her here at home. Our parenting journey has not ended. And I know this because I'm 55 and my mother's parenting journey has not ended. She's still actively parenting me every day. Um, but uh, I've been thinking a lot about when she was at home and about being a parent and all the things that I learned. And um, this is a poem called Tiny Parent, version two. Imagine you are a little bird activated by instinct, wait, chip, chirp, emerge, unfold, cry out for air, for food, all of it natural like the quench of rain and dew, all of it. The process by which you pull a pre-chewed worm into your tiny gut, the hair of your nestling life within the brood, how familiar that life is, how easy it is to dwell within your mud and twigs, twine and gum, feathers, leaves. Those larger birds who feed you belong to you and you to them. You may rely on them for everything, then fewer things, fewer, fewer, little, launch, release, and fall, labor toward flight, all instinct. Imagine now some little birds are yours. Some of what you know of care, you will know by heart. This is how to clean your hatchlings. This is a sound for hunger 
this is a cry for thirst. The circling shadows present a problem requiring your response. Your every instinct won't be enough. Some of what you will know, you will know from when you were a chick. Your only flight plan may be flawed. My own father was mostly talons and beak, feathers ruffled, something usually bulging his gullet. I had to choose, replicate or replace. Maybe you'll have to choose to replicate or replace, replicate or replace parents as you were parented or choose something new. When you reach that decision point, you may find yourself in midair with nothing to grasp but memories and desire. You may feel yourself suspended between the bird you were and the bird you hope to be. In that moment, I wish I could advise you keep every beautiful thing, shed everything mean, but I learned that isn't how it works. The truth is you are still the little bird you were unfolding into understanding you will live on in some future home. Your hollowed bones, the spine of walls, your feathers, insulation, your dust with dew as mud for mortar. Um, I lost my place. Bear with me for just a second. Uh, postcard from the bottom of a lake. In Maiden Rock, along Pepin's north shore, a single hawk hovers in late morning sky, swift shadow across pale blue-white. Its glide suggests effortlessness. Summer now, and nestlings can fly. I'm on retreat, seeking lightness and quiet. Here, in a cottage surrounded by windows, windows through which I see daylilies and trees, butterflies and passerines. In my writer's thesaurus, diurnal follows ditzy, and ditzy means feather-brained, and this proximity to the word I thought, sought feels serendipitous. Did you know Lake Pepin exists in two states? At dusk, I'll swim there and watch ruthless birds ride the thermals, parents free of offspring, juveniles migrating away. I'll float, imagining my fledgling fledged, myself fledged, Later, when work is done, I will dive into the vast lake sourced by a river that is always, always flowing south. A couple more to share from the book. But first, I'm going to do the thing I always do. is like, what page is it on? Uh, bear with me for just a moment. Ah, here we go. Uh, this is a poem that I wrote thinking about the water protectors in North Dakota when they were fighting for sovereignty and treaty rights and water rights a number of years ago, thinking about how their fight for justice and autonomy and for rights reminded me of my own people's fight for rights. I use a phrase in here, non proton, this is a legal concept, which means then for now. And I also mentioned a neighborhood in St. Paul called the Rondo neighborhood. It is one of dozens and dozens of neighborhoods throughout the United States uh, that were largely Black, were the center for the Black community, often thriving, and um, were where the interstate highways were almost always installed here all alone. Raptors ride the thermals above Dakota. Beyond them, the sun appears closer, colder. Everything warm escapes, returns. 100 nations assemble in Congress, this time for water, where water is life. And I know this isn't my song to sing, but I wonder what God saves grace for hunters. Water cannons, fire hoses, nunk, protunk. This land, once yours, was flooded and dammed.
the same day our rondo was cleaved for a highway. And I know I've seen those attack dogs before with the same blue force undoing brown bodies, foul water in Flint, good water in Bismarck, bullets, bulldozers, bad pipes, hollow promises. What birds are these? Still circling, circling while God denies grace for the hunted. Warm air sent rising makes gliding look easy while shale beneath us fractures, relents. So why must the earth grow colder than harden and leave us to shiver here all alone, singing sad songs of foremothers, forefathers, while above the raptors exhort us to pray, to pray to a God who saves grace for hunters. And I'll, I'll close with uh, a poem. Uh, one of the things I like uh, to do in my writing is um, to, to let people know that I love them. I, I think all the time, like, what is the mission of the poet? What is our work in the world? What might it be? And as I think about that, I'm called all the time to love um, of community, of land, of people in general, but also of specific the specific people in my lives, in my life. I like to, at the end of the year, uh, share a poem with my friends. Uh, I feel like it's almost ready and I wanted to read it tonight to all of you as a way to say thank you to Simmons and Christy and Drew, to my new friend Rowan, to my good friend Liz, to all the people who are here with us tonight. Um, just a, an offering, a message of, of love. So I'll share that with you now. Song. Hold on just a second. The chat is blocking me. Song. In our winter house, we amplify rest. As new snow arrives like notes and decrescendo, we follow the song. Blues that kindle a jovial jazz essence spruce and pine, inside, outside. May your world be like this too, blessed with what the season offers and might, alive. Fire, a quiet time visits. We lean in gently and listen. We slow our bodies. Our hearts regulate. Our hearth offers oranges and a fragrant, smoky incense simmering like gestures bellowed, especially for us, full of warmth and light, desire, alive, alive. Song fire. In our winter house of quiet time visits, we amplify rest. We lean in gently and listen as new snow arrives. We slow our bodies like notes in decrescendo. Our hearts regulate. We follow the song. Our hearth offers oranges and blues that kindle a jovial jazz, a fragrant smoky essence, spruce and pine, incense simmering inside, outside, like gestures bellowed, especially for us. May your world be like this too, full of warmth and light, desire, blessed with what this season offers and might alive, alive, alive. Wow. Thank you so much, Michael. That was really beautiful. Thank you for sharing your love with us in such a personal and beautiful way. Mm. We are going to move now to Elizabeth Bradfield, who I am so excited to introduce. Um, 
I, I met Liz a couple years ago and just continually in the last year or two of knowing her and moved by her generosity and her wisdom um, that she shares so hospitably. Elizabeth Bradfield's most recent books are Toward Antarctica and Cascadia Field Guide, Art, Ecology, Poetry. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Atlantic Monthly, Poetry, The Sun, and Terrain.org. And her honors include the Audre Lorde Prize and a Stegner Fellowship. Stegner Fellowship. Based on Kate Codd, Liz works as a naturalist, teaches at Brandeis University, and runs Broadsided Press. Liz, we're excited to hear from you. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Simmons. Oh my gosh, and Rowan and Michael. Um, man, what a what a gathering to be part of. I'm really, I'm really honored. And oh, after your beautiful words, I'm like, okay, so now I'm gonna bring it, bring it down a little. I'm gonna I'm gonna lower the bar. So I'm gonna start <laughs> with a poem called A Mouth Like a Sailor. Um, from this new manuscript that I think I'm working on. Um, it's kind of, you know, like, how do you swear without swearing? Hmm. A mouth like a sailor. You haws dog, you chalk block and scuff plug, davit swinger, your binnacle's deviant and your hatch is not tight. Bunk bum, I hate your forecastle, and I bet your gunnels banged up as a skeg on a shoal. You're a hard chine, wrong reeved, a knot's in your bite, and your hawser won't haul. Bollard, skivvy waver, your afterbrow and your thrusters got no dig. On dog watch, you're flaked out. Stick a fid in your splice, scuttle. You wouldn't know fancy work if it hit you with a French whip. You're a pintle in the gudgeon. You'll never come about, you Danforth, Deadeye, Belayed and Hove, Seacock, you limber hole, you're all belay, belay, Kedget and the capstan you came in on. Your bottom's fouled and so's your anchor. Into the last lubber line, yaw all you like, you'll never make way with me. I'm not your waypoint, not your following sea. So there. Um you know there's a lot of yearning but i've got a lot of bluster protecting it so, so you'll have to walk with me uh through the morass of my uh defenses um the the next poem also has kind of a a front of um both i guess resistance and beneath it uh sorrow uh i i stopped working as a naturalist on ships, I used to work on ships in the Antarctic, um, Greenland, et cetera, uh, before the pandemic. And I, I stopped that work and I'm, I've been mourning it. I, I left for a good reason. Um, anyway, um, here's a poem titled Origin Story Rewrought. For decades, I was part of a machine I loved. It mothered me raised me up from what sad self I was, bookish, theoretical, unbodied. By dog watch, by heaving line, by windlass and engine rounds, by Roger that, I learned a life. She was conservative, this mother, her corporate particulars, guest, not passenger, stateroom, not cabin, no tattoos back then, no piercings, other than the two small lobe holes girls were allowed. She pretended to not notice my nose ring, my raised eyebrow. I loved the stories she told at night in the darkened pilot house, as I watched with captain or mate for real dangers. We once ran aground, and the predicted navigational winks telling us where we were, where? and what to avoid. What to avoid? Whistling, bananas, women, queers. My first true love and I chuckled then kissed in the gear locker breast to breast. Look, I slept inside her, that mother. I slept inside her with my siblings, Frank and Nori and Tom and Michael, or more exactly, we shared cabins bunk by bunk 
watch by watch. We slept together in the spell of what it was to choose to sleep there. Innocent then of marketing, marketing, carbon, and trotting, and the older, cooler cousins, officers, engineers, naturalists who'd done this for decades, I studied them. Sometimes I, too, pulled up the long brass zipper of my boiler suit and got ready to grind metal or paint a rail with toxic stuff that would endure a while in the tough air. Sometimes I, too, drove the Zodiac, stood with hand on tiller, left knee braced against the port pontoon. Years later, youth purged, they welcomed me. Let me lecture on bears or whales or lichen. Sometimes I, mm, fuck it, listen, we were fooling ourselves even then, even then in those days, we knew there was rot and wrong in this, or we should have. Um, this next poem, this next poem, this next book that I'm working on, um, like, like Michael, I'm trying to pull some stuff together and see if it'll stick as a book. Um, and it's been a while coming, I suppose. Uh, but the title of this book, I think, is So Far, which is both so far and also um, an acronym for the sound and frequency ranging channel in the ocean, which is a layer of water in the ocean. You go down deep enough and you've got a pressure and temperature gradient in which sound acts like a fiber optic cable like it bounces along and it travels extraordinary distances and so this is how fin whales and blue whales specifically which have vocalizations that are below the range of human hearing infrasonic sound um, their vocalizations can travel across entire ocean basins so i'm thinking about this idea of deep listening of listening across impossible distances um, and about the ocean in general so this is, I don't know, I'm reading it for the first time now, so I don't know. Let's see how it goes. Uh, so far, an Ars Poetica or Toward Deep Listening. I take the silver bob, marshmallow, marshmallow sized, switch on the speaker, put sounding plugs into the shells of my ears, pay out the black cord coiled in my left hand, yard by fathom. Tide and current vibrato it. I can't go far enough to reach that perfect depth, that sound channel, not here, not in this harbor, with this, but I'll listen to what I can. Over the side, my own face warbles, squinting down. Glasses polarized only permit so much against glint and depth. The speaker translates what hits the bob and thrums up wire, pushes into air what hits the skin pulled across my ear's drum, stone of sound in this sea. Listen, water, prop wine, water. Imagine the bob, passive lure like one an anglerfish dangles before herself, but ready to capture sound. The beloved frustration of white noise, boat noise, spun time, then sea robin, cusk eel, gray seal, white-sided dolphin. What am I, human and other, even listening for? Is this my business? One night last summer, anchored out in local water, sound woke us, it woke us. I fumbled the gear, dropped the bob, what buzzed, a hammering, almost woodpecker-like that came to sound like teeth gnashing in some kind of hunger or rage I had never known. Squitters, anchored, broke the dark with their bright light lures. I'm sure they could hear what we heard and didn't know in air. It was loud underwater, loud and angry and strange. Maybe not, maybe feasting glee, maybe party chatter, but what do I know of any of that? I listen still. Um, I do wanna read um, a couple excerpts from Cascadia Field Guide not uh not poems but you know the being stories of cascadia field guide maybe i'll just read one uh the being stories of cascadia field guide 
Derek Sheffield and C. Marie Furman and I wrote, and we call them being stories instead of natural history. Hey, Drew, I see that. Instead of natural history accounts, um, because we wanted to share the natural history, the scientific information, the cultural knowledge, the personal experience of these beings, whether it's a sea otter or a banana slug or a larch slash tamarack, um, and invite people who might not be inclined to read natural history into knowing both the wonder um, and the information that these beings imbue. So um, I'll read, I guess, just the being story. I'm looking at time here. I'll read the being story for Big's killer whale, um, which some of you might know as transient killer whales. Um, these are the mammal eaters of the Pacific Northwest and Northern Pacific. You know, there are ecotypes of killer whales all around the globe. Three in the Pacific Northwest, one in the North Atlantic that we don't understand very well. Then there's Norway ones. Then there's a few in Antarctica. I mean, killer whales, orca are amazing and complicated. And we're just starting to understand the nuances of their lives. But the Biggs killer whale, the transient killer whales of the Pacific Northwest um, are mammal eaters. And that makes them, well, let me just read the story. Um, which I was very happy to write. Biggs killer whale. You see that fin slicing up through the surface, tall, tall, taller, until at last the body follows and an exhaled plume of breath huffs up. You know you're in the presence of killer whale. Suddenly, the sea around you is enlivened, its mystery breached by the rise of this sleek, powerful body from the depths. For native coastal people of Cascadia, this being, blackfish, orca, killer whale, keet, grampus, skaana, has always been an important community member, never eaten or hunted. Many stories and songs have been written and sung about orca, and as you travel the waters of Cascadia, we hope you will seek them from elders and storytellers. If the blackfish fin is the height of a human, you're looking at a mature male, if sickle curved and about half that height, you have a youngster or a matriarch before you. Maybe you can even see the saddle patch, a paler, cloudy swoosh across Orca's back, just along and behind the dorsal fin. But is this Orca a resident or transient, now known as Biggs, fish eater or mammal eater, or something else offshore? Take a bit more time, look again. How many are in the group? And are they traveling close together or widely spread apart? Maybe you're close enough to evaluate whether the saddle patch is open or closed, terms biologists use to describe the shape. A closed patch, with Biggs has, is solid, smoky white, with no black inside. Residents can have either open or closed patches. Drop a hydrophone and listen. Are they calling to one another constantly, or are they conspicuously silent? If there's cavorting involved, are the pectoral flippers crazy large? In all honesty, even such close observation might not bring you certainty. Three types of killer whales traverse the waters of Cascadia, and although for a human it can take time and careful training to distinguish them, these whales know each other well and easily by language alone. Genetically distinct for thousands of years, these ecotypes have different cultures, food preferences, and habits. It would not be surprising if, in the future, scientists declare them separate species. Big's killer whale specializes on marine mammals such as doll's porpoise, harbor porpoise, harbor seal, and sea lion. They've been known to take otter for sport, and even, in a coordinated group, adult humpback whale or gray whale. The fact that Big's orca feed high up on the food chain is, for them, both boon and burden. These whales carry the concentrated pollutants, PCBs and mercury, that all beings they've eaten have eaten. That females pass these contaminants along to their young in their milk is a particularly brutal fact in their matriarchal culture. If you're lucky and encounter these beings just after a successful hunt, one of them may approach your boat to show you a bit of what's been caught, nosing a chunk of meat up to the surface as if to brag. 
Big killer whale, like all orcas, travel in matriarchally led family groups. Demonstrating success and technique to younger members of the family is an important part of their culture. In that moment, are you part of the pod? It's lovely to imagine so. We have so much to learn from the journeys, conversations, cultures, families, and adaptations Orca have shared with us. We are lucky each time we have a chance to greet them. Um, so that's one of the being stories. And I think I want to end with, hmm, I'm going to end with a poem titled The Paper Wasps. That's newer. The Paper Wasps. In each of the 14 jars on the sill above my desk, a paper wasp. I didn't know what else to do when they started bumbling the air, long legs dangling like an airlifted cows. I watched them clean their beautiful faces. I watched them move up and down the jar sides. They can see each other warbled through the lettering. I put myself in this room most days, put my mind into the machine before me. At first I'd usher them out, open the door to spring's thin air, but more and more kept coming and I wanted to forget my body. Only one so far has died, smaller and dry and curled. I could put it outside for the birds. I could use the jar for another and another, and I don't think I'd feel badly if I didn't put them on the shelf above the screen of the thing I put myself into. But I did. Of course, I can release myself. Of course, I can do that. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Liz. We are going to move into, we've got about 18 minutes left for some Q&A. So those of you who are listening, if you have a question, stick it in the chat. Drew and I are going to tag team back and forth here, tossing some of those questions to our three readers. And I'm going to start us off with my own question here. All three of you brought up this idea of kinship with the more than human world, this deep listening, whether it's with corn, whether it's the park and the birds and the dogs, or the whales, the culture of the whales. And I would just love to know from each of you, how is this posture of kinship with the more than human world woven into your days as a writer, as a human? What does it actually look like to hold that posture of kinship? I could start a little, I suppose. I mean, I'm wary of using the term kinship because I think for some people that holds a lot of cultural significance. <clears throat> and um, I will say that I think that the act of attending, of paying attention, of being attendant to the world around me is something that offers huge solace. And by looking, listening, tasting. Um, I find the ways that I connect with the world around me. And, and if I do that well, where I make a home, if I travel elsewhere, I can find little bridges. And suddenly, you know, being in Norway or being in Argentina is new and exciting and strange, but also I, I sense uh, connections. Um, because I've been paying attention to my home place in such interesting ways. And to me, that way that paying attention expands connection um, or offers a bridge to other places for me is really important because if I, if I can really honor that and um, listen, then maybe I can be present equally elsewhere more quickly as a stranger to a place. Mm, that's so beautiful, Elizabeth. Um, I guess I can chime in. I uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, I uplifted uh, a beautiful thought around kinship from uh, Tyson Yunkaporta, who wrote 
Sand Talk, which has been a, a really beautiful book that I've uplifted recently. And he talks about how kinship mind and how I just have the quote pulled up here. He says, kinship mind is a way of improving and preserving memory in relationship with others. If you learn something with or from another person, this knowledge now sits in the relationship between you. You can access the memory of it best when you're together, but if you're separated, you can recall the knowledge by picturing the other person or calling out their name. This way of thinking and remembering is not limited to relationships with people. And so I've been thinking a lot about that in um, the way in which I write, the way in which I um, relate to people who I work alongside. And as someone who writes often about my uh, apprenticeship to my more than human mentors and teachers, which have been plants for me and, and just the way that they engage with the, the natural world, um, recognizing that as I build a, a memory landscape or an, uh, in, in my life through my lived experience, that um, each and every season that kinship memory builds, like that the the teachings that those kin or those beings um, the, that tapestry strengthens and grows um, that kinship memory between us. And so I've just really been thinking a lot about that and thinking a lot about um, in particular, the way in which I think we're all designed to have a very relational kinship mind. I think we're all born of, of that type of way of thinking and being. And so even in my sense-making and in my note-making, as I try and digest life's experiences, um, continuing to try and make playful connections between unexpected things. Like that's what I was loving. My pat my thought pattern mind here listening tonight was just seeing all these um, connections, these unexpected connections between the three writers and the thing, the themes that we were leaning into. And so I just try and remember that we are relational in the way that we inhabit the world and so what are the ways in which I can continue to bring that in to my writing practice my note making my sense making and my um deep listening when I'm out in the world and I have a word I know I talked with this with, in, with Chrissy's class at writing the wild but I call it reverent curiosity which is sort of this way of sitting with the more than human kin in the world and just deeply listening and being in that observation mode so that's kind of how I weave it into my day to day. Mm. How about you, Michael? Yeah, so I <clears throat> am such a city mouse, uh, and as I was, there's a, that part in your poem where you said that you were bookish, theoretical, and embodied. <clears throat> just resonated so deeply with me because for so much of my life, in a different way, right? I think your work has always been connected to the earth and to the water and you know, I was in law libraries and stuff like that, but uh, unbodied is the part that I kind of really resonate with. And for me, like a pivotal learning moment in my life in ways that I could be almost a little embarrassed about was the pandemic. Um, I was working from home in the room that I'm sitting in right now. And I realized that for the first time in my adult life, I had uh, an office with a window that could open <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so it, it was open and I could hear birds singing all day. I could hear squirrels. Do squirrels sing or do they chortle? I could hear squirrels <laughs> noise making all day. Um, I went out a lot uh, at the behest of, of two critters who live here and, and claimed that they needed to go out multiple times a day. And in doing that, uh, the city was sheltering in place. I live on a busy street. No cars were on it, hardly at all. And it took almost no time for my relationship to the plants and animals that are right here by my city house to change radically. First, I was here. I was present. I had time in the day to, to really be present. And also... Uh, I, you know, I would walk right up to a bush full of uh, house sparrows. Um, it, for a while, I thought they were pine siskins, Drew, because I was like, you know how you make it fancy? Like, uh, but they were house sparrows uh, and they didn't move. I had a robin 
walk right by me once on a path. Uh, fox, coyote, deer that are in the park all the time um, were more present, more available. And one of the things that I took to that is that kinship um, in nature is always there for us. And that to the extent that we cannot claim it or that we're distanced from it, that's because of what we're doing, right? Um, and so if we change what we're doing, our relationship to the land, to the earth, to the plants, to the animals that are already here uh, changes radically. Um, and and so for me, it it also absolutely changed my writing in ways I, Chrissy, I didn't even realize until later. I'm like, man, birds are all over the place now. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think uh, that moment, that learning, um, the relationships with animals that I have that here in the house and um, here by my house um, has allowed me to think about kinship in more expansive ways. Well, Michael, um, Eva has a, kind of a follow-up question for you in a way, and it's she, she asked, when did you decide you wanted your writing to heal others? So this is a relational question as well. Oh, wow. I am not entirely sure I did. I, I think for so long I was trying to heal myself, trying to understand myself, trying to put um, events from my life, events from the world into some kind of perspective for me, uh, often not thinking about the poem ever leaving the house, ever finding its way into the world to have its own conversations. And, and so early on, I think it was just, this is an idea that I really want to spend some time with. I think that writing and art, these are just such human things. And embedded in that, just in a way that's very organic, is as we express what we're feeling, what we're concerned about, what we're hoping for, um, we're resonating with people who have had similar experiences or can see your particular experience in a way that is meaningful to them. Even now, uh, as I have had opportunities to to think of myself as a writer and to do that and to send things out and to find home for things, and even as I think about audience all the time as I'm writing things, the furthest I can take it is to hope, to hope that what I have to share will mean something worthwhile or significant to, to whoever finds it. Um, the healer part is a little bit harder to claim, but hope, hope in that, not so much as something that I'm doing, but as something that we're doing together feels easier to, to lay my hands on. Mm. Thank you, Michael. That's, it, it makes me think of your earlier question of what is the mission of the poet? And you said to love. And I want to throw that question also to Liz and to Rowan. And how would you articulate, maybe not the mission of every poet, but your mission as a poet or as a writer? I don't know. I think, you know, I've taken this oppositional stance in which sometimes I feel like my mission as a poet is to show the ways I have failed at love or other people have failed at love and you know i don't know it can be a little contrarian and that energy can be a little fun for me that snarky energy but i think underneath it is a desire that we understand that flawed self and and do better right see how we do it wrong so we can do better honestly um but I think, um, you know, like with the paper wasp poem or with that, you know, mouth like a sailor poem and a jillion others, there's a lot of bluster in those or there's a lot of taking this um, stance of just really trying to look hard and honestly at the worst part of myself 
or the worst part of others that I've seen and then asking myself, why do I think that's so bad about others? Geez, Liz, you know, dial it back. Um, but I think for me, it can be useful because I think hopefully underneath that, what comes through is not like, oh, you're so judgy, but mm, there's a yearning to connect and these are the barriers these are the barriers. If we see them, if we articulate them, maybe we can get beyond them. Plus, sometimes they're funny. Beautiful. Thank you, Liz. Elizabeth. Um, I think for me, I mean, there's a lot of ways I could go with this, but what came to mind is that um, my writing is. Uh, a way of is a resistance and uh, you know and not to have that be cliche but my grandmother my grandparents were taken away to residential schools and beaten for speaking their original language so my grandparents were original Mohawk speakers that was their first language and so my parents and my generation we speak the tongue of our ancestral enemy right and so I write in English and, and so I think in some ways, like there's a thread that I'm always weaving through the writing that I share in the world and the writing that I engage in every day is that, that we're not a conquered people, that we're still here and that we are subverting the, I think some of the violences of the English language, that the, the nouns, that everything is static and this and trying to stretch it like the way that my grandmother spoke English was so beautiful because it was in the syntax of Mohawk, the way that she saw the world was very animate. Like Mohawk language has this verb, it's a glutinative language. So everything is a verb and then it's relational. So it, it, every word is sort of a sentence. And so the way that she spoke English was like with this Mohawk mind, right? And so I, I in some ways, uh, use my public platform. I, I really started sharing my writing on Instagram in 2014, so just about 10 years ago. And that was at a time where I just needed a practice of, of accountability to see the beauty in every day and to share a picture and some words and to say there's a million beautiful things in the world when there are a trillion betrayals in our world that make us you know sad and 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 you know are difficult and so um perhaps we can use our writing i think all all of the writers here tonight we use our writing in to subvert the you know the the culture of extraction the culture of scarcity the culture of destruction um, that we see so dominant across the globe right now I felt that in each and every one of your writings. And I wrote today on my Instagram about the storyteller. I quoted Leslie Marmon Silko, who's just a fantastic native writer. And I thought about the ways in which um, she talks about the storyteller's escape. You can see the, if you go to my Instagram, you could see the qu full quote later. But I was thinking about um, from the enslaved black folk on this land and their tradition of making showway quilts, you know, the escape quilts. And the way in which our writing can be those sort of show way quilts that help give us the guideposts out of empire, out of this very destructive dominant culture. And so in some ways that is my approach to writing in the English language as a native woman is to continue to subvert it and to be resistant, to be resistance and to just say, to find these pathways to get us to be thinking in different ways, right? And feeling in different ways. So hopefully mm. our writing evokes those feelings and that sense of a different way of being because we all have that way of knowing and seeing the world in our blood and our bones from our ancestors. And so writing can evoke that and pull it out, right? So, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Our time has grown short here, um, but I know our thoughts are long and our hearts are warm. I wanted to share a bit um, in gratitude and 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 maybe um, a common theme, I think, 
of what we gift one another, even in these dark times. This is called Field Mark Six, Love Handle. Handle any life in your hands as if it were your own. Feel that heart beating small as it may be and imagine it in your own chest beating in syncopated time to become shared meter. That pulse, that breathing, that is your rhythm, your ins, your outs, its ins, its outs. Look closely under whatever warty skin or soft fur or gaudy feathers and see self. Its being is your being. Be in that same skin for what moments it will allow. Then when the convergence between you is sealed, release that wild soul to free roaming as you would desire your own. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Simmons. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Rowan. Yes, thank you everyone so much for being here tonight. This was really special. What an honor. Be well, everyone. Take care, everybody. Mm.